All right, so this is going to be my video on vitamin K2 statins and vascular calcification. The reason I'm making this video is because recently I was looking at the literature and I came across a study that was very interesting uh, to me and I want to present to you and let people be aware of it. So, uh, so it was basically the interplay of how vitamin K2 and statins can interplay and how this can impact vascular calcification. calcification. And so basically uh, this presentation will be shorter than my first one. Uh, it won't be as long. Uh, but uh, if you found you find yourself uh, being a little uh, confused or lost at some of the terms that I'm throwing at you, then you can always refer to my first presentation uh, where I go into detail about terms such as UCMGP and CMGP and UCOC and COC and how that interplays with vitamin K2 status in order for you to fully understand this presentation but uh, nonetheless I'll try to make sure that you will be able to understand this presentation as much as you can. So without further ado uh, let's just get into it. I'll start off with a quick recap of statins, place in therapy, uh, study how I found it, what it is, results, my, what I think, and limitations. So what are statins? Well statins are an acetyl-CoA reductase inhibitor so what this is, is basically inside the liver, you have an endogenous enzyme there known as acetyl-CoA, and it helps to make cholesterol. And by inhibiting this enzyme, you lower cholesterol through the inhibition of this enzyme. And what that does, that causes your LDL to be lower, and that's why your doctor gives you a statin if your cholesterol is high. Uh, but uh, recently, we've also found that... Uh, Basically, statins are very pleiotropic, which means that they have a lot of different effects uh, that are not limited to just the cholesterol lowering. So one of these is actually the anti, uh, being anti-inflammatory. And uh, the way they do this is that they reduce C-reactive protein levels, which are a marker of inflammation all over your, all over your body, and also secondarily through the lowering of LDL itself. So LDL is actually inflammatory, and if you lower the inflammatory something that is inflammatory, that's going to lower your inflammation and be anti-inflammatory. Furthermore, it also helps to reduce pro-inflammatory cytokines. So what cytokines are are basically hormones of the immune system, and the and uh, these uh, there are two pro-inflammatory ones. Tumor necrosis factor alpha and interferon gamma. And by uh, reducing the levels of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, that also helps to reduce inflammation. So uh, through these two mechanisms and more mechanisms, because statins are pleiotropic, it helps to reduce cardiovascular disease and mortality. And there's good evidence for this because statins are basically prescribed everywhere and a lot of people are taking statins. And we have very good evidence that they work and they help to reduce cardiovascular death and mortality. But where do they actually fit in a therapy in the clinical guidelines? So when you're about to be prescribed a statin or these are the guidelines or what informs your doctor to make sure if statin therapy is good for you. So if you're low risk, uh, basically uh, for primary prevention for people who have not had a, a cardiovascular disease before, uh, event before, so for example, heart attack and want to lower their chances of getting at such an event in the future, there's a, uh, that is called primary prevention. And uh, sometimes uh, for people that this is correct for, they can take a stand to lower their chances. So in order to make that determination, there are three different boxes. So there's low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk based off the Framingham risk score, which takes into account a bunch of your variables and sees how likely you are to receive a cardiovascular event in the, in the next 10 years. So if you have low risk, uh, there's no need for you to get a stand therapy unless you have some of those predisposing risk factors uh, on the slide. Now, if you have an intermediate risk with Frankham risk score of 10 to 20%, and, and an additional risk factor of like LDL over 3.5, non-HDL or 4.2, or an ApoB over 1.05, uh, and or uh, any of those other additional risk factors, 
Then uh, you can talk with your doctor to see if a stand is right for you and you would get a start on a stand. Or if you're high risk, then you would also get started on a stand because we have good evidence to prove that it does work. I forgot to mention that these are based off the CCS 2021 dyslipidemia guidelines, which were released just this year. Now, they, uh, I can make a whole video on just the guidelines and how they have changed, but I will hold that off for perhaps another video because it would be too extensive in order to do that in this video. So I'll just uh, hold off to uh, quickly that. So if you also have a sun indicated condition, so this might uh, be atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease in which you've already had an event, and in which case it is called secondary prevention. So if you had an MI before, or a heart attack, or an acute coronary syndrome in ACS, then that would be secondary prevention because you've already got it. Or if you have stable angina, a stroke, TIA, peripheral arterial disease, reclotication, or an abdominal, abdominal aortic aneurysm, then uh, you should go in a high intensity statin uh, because we have good evidence to prove that it does work. Now, um, if you haven't had a uh, if you haven't had a cardiovascular event before, then perhaps you are fit into uh, uh, one of the statin indicating conditions, which are diabetes or LDL. And now, if you have a really high LDL, then you should go into standard therapy to lower that and lower your chances of cardiovascular event in the future. If you have diabetes and your age is over 40 or your age is over 30 and you've had diabetes type 2 for at least 15 years or microvascular disease, or if you also have a, a CKD or chronic kidney disease with your age being over 50 or GFR less than 60 or ACR over 3, then you should also go on stand and in order to reduce your chances of having cardiovascular disease, uh, a cardiovascular event in the future. Atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease is known as secondary prevention. The LDL and diabetes, they're not, real, not really secondary prevention, still primary prevention because a person hasn't had a cardiovascular event first, but we do want to reduce their chances of having an event in the future. So well, if you're starting on a stand, what kind of stand can you get started on? Well, we do have quite a few actually on the market. So we have Rasudistan, we have a Torvastan, we have Pravastan, we have Fluistan, and we have Simvastan. So, but the stand that you're most likely to be prescribed is probably Rasudistan or Turvastan, also known as Crestor and Lipitor. And these are the stands that are the two most uh, prescribed stands right now on the market. So, now let's get into the study, which uh, I found very interesting. So recently there have been debates on the safety issues of stands on social media, and uh, there have been increasing uh, documented accounts of vascular calcification happening with statins. So, but statin-induced calcification is relatively unknown. We don't really know the incidence or how often it happens or to what effect. So, but we do know that vascular calcification is not a passive process. It's very active and highly regulated. There are a lot of enzymes that help to promote this and inhibit this. So some, some of those are actually UCMGP or CMGP, which is a local inhibitor of vascular calcification and is a marker of K2 status, and UCOC or COC, which uh, while its effect on vascular calcification is unknown, it is a marker of K2 status. So as I mentioned in my previous video, uh, taking uh, in metoquinones or vitamin K2 helps to carboxylate, uh, carboxylate UCMGP and also UCOC. UCMGP is carboxylated to CMGP and uh, UCOC is carboxylated to COC. So, uh, uh, un, um, so once it's carboxylated, it becomes CMGP or COC, carboxylate ester calcium, carboxylated matrix CO1-alpha protein. So carboxylated matrix CO1-alpha protein is found on the surface of blood vessels and helps to inhibit that wear and tear and calcification happening on blood vessels. So COC is carboxylated osteocalcin is found in bone and helps to incorporate calcium into the bone matrix. So both uh, you. UM, UCMGP and UCOC or CMGP or COC can be used as a marker of vitamin K2 status. So uh, remember, it is kind of inverse, inverse though. So if you're UCMG, 
uh, UCM GP level is low, then your vitamin K2 status is high. Alternatively, if your UCM GP level is high, then your vitamin K2 status is low. If your UCOC is high, that means your, your vitamin K2 is low. If your UCOC is high, is low then uh, uh, if it's low then your vitamin k2 is high so so uh talking about the study now it was published in a journal by a journal from taiwan in february 2021 it was a medical examination of 98 inpatients and hospital uh it was interesting to note that they actually didn't mention which hospital this was but uh, 98 patients, uh, it was a small amount, but it was a nonetheless uh, interesting study. It was uh, composed of 98 inpatients, 47 which were controls at moderate high risk of cardiovascular disease, and uh, 51 with uh, clinical cardiovascular disease. And in the clinical cardiovascular disease, we had 32 with atrial fibrillation and 19 with uh, heart failure with reserved ejection fraction. And the researchers uh, made three groups out of this. So there was a control plus cardiovascular disease group. So in total, 98 patient, uh, in, uh, people. And there was the control group. And the control group was 47 people. And the cardiovascular disease group was 51 people. And in each group, it was uh, subdivided into standard and non-standard users. So if in the control and cardiovascular disease group, you would have standard and non-standard users. In the control group, you would have standard and non-standard users. And in the cardiovascular disease group, you would have standard and non So this is their table one, or what was the baseline characteristics of basically the people in the groups. You could see that they were uh, uh, aged, aged a bit. Uh, they, were, they were also uh, somewhere on standards and somewhere not on standards. Uh, what, uh, what I will direct your attention towards is just the LDL and the triglycerides, or denoted as the LDLC and the TC. And you can see that in the standard users in all three uh, groups, it was uh, statistically significant. So, uh, but that's what we expect to see because uh, by taking a standard, you'll reduce your LDL and your triglycerides, which we want uh, because that's associated with the improved cardiovascular outcomes. So that's just an expected finding. But otherwise than that, the groups were, uh, as you can see, all, uh, they were all non-statistically significant. So which means they're all relatively the same. So uh, the results. So what the researchers did is on all these people, they did a coronary artery calcium score, or a CACS. Uh, and they obtained this on all participants with the CT. So with this donut donut shape shaped machine over here, uh, and they also measured the UCMGP, the UCOC, the COC, and the UCR, which was they just called uh, this UCOC over COC, and uh, GRP, which is just an additional measure. Uh, and there's nothing statistically significant about it in this study, so it won't really be explained further. And they were measured. And statistical analysis was then used by the researchers in order to compare the group. So this is what they found, the results. And as you can see, if you look at the coronary area calcium score in all the patients, uh, for the stand non-users and then the stand users, the stand users had a much bigger calcium artery score, which was uh, significant. If you look at the controls for or these are the people that did not have clinical cardiovascular disease, and if you look at stand non-users and stand users, then uh, they also had their, this was also statistically significant. And uh, for the cardiovascular disease patients, uh, if you, again, if you look at stand non-users and stand users, this was uh, clinically significant. Now, uh, what's also interesting to note, if you look, uh, the UCMGP, this was not, is significant but if you look at the ucoc the ucoc for all patients was significant and that's kind of interesting because uh, they're both markers of k2 status but only the ucoc is lower is is changed uh and then if you look at the controls or these are the people without the clinical cardiovascular disease and moderate to high risk of 
Party Rescue Funds, then you can see that the UCMGP level is not statistically significant. But if you look at the UCOC level, it's very statistically significant. And then if you look at the cardiovascular disease patients, neither uh, UCMGP or uh, UCOC are statistically significant. And if you look at the COC levels, they're not, uh, not pretty much the same. Uh, if, you, if you also look at the COC levels and the controls, they're pretty much the same. And if you also look at the COC levels and the cardiovascular disease patients, they're pretty much the same. So no change on the COC levels in that part. Now, if you look at the UCR, which is the research, researchers made this new parameter, which is basically UCOC over COC, uh, is what's statistically significant, but this is mostly driven by the UCOC value, which was changed and which was statistically significant here. You can also see that in the controls it was a little bit more, had more of an effect here. And you can also see it in the cardiovascular disease patients as well. So, and then GRP as well here, this wasn't really significant. I don't really pay attention to it. So then they also included this additional analysis here. So, so uh, this is upon like uh, correlations that the researchers have made uh, upon all the participants. So on the, how the statins influence the UCOC level uh, with the vitamin K antagonist excluded because vitamin K antagonist, some people, I think four or five people were taking vitamin K antagonist such as warfarin and warfarin has very high, is very documented to cause calcification by its effects on vitamin K antagonism. So in order to produce any confounders, the researchers help to exclude the vitamin K antagonist. So if you look at the standard non-users and the standard users, so the standard users had a higher UCOC level, but and they also had a higher UCR level. But now if you look at how the CA, C, uh, the coronary calcium score versus the UCOC level, uh, in all the patients kind of compare it, you can see that there's a positive association, which means that the higher that your UCOC level is, the higher that your coronary artery calcium score will be. So if your UCOC level increases, that means if your vitamin K2 status decreases, then your coronary artery calcium score goes up, which is bad. So then they also did the same analysis in the coronary calcium score versus UCMGP in all patients. So this one was UCOC or uh, osteocalcin on carboxylate, and this was on carboxylate co one alpha protein, and you could see no association. So it's only being present for the carboxylate osteocalcin. Now, if you look at the coronary calcium score versus uncarboxylate osteocalcin and stand users, uh, there is association, which pretty much looks the same uh, for C, pretty much the same. But if you look at uh, C, uh, the coronary artery calcium score versus UCOC and stand non-users, it's very, very small, very small. So it's being driven by the stand, by the use of the stand. So what did the authors mostly find in this study? So first of all, they found that uh, that uh, with statin, it actually increases vascular calcification because remember, uh, when we go back here, when we go back here with the statin, in almost all of the one, in in all of the groups, it increases the coronary artery calcium score. So, but isn't that strange? Because we use uh, statins for being first line for the prevention and the treatment of uh, atherosclerotic disease. But we have good evidence that uh, they work to reduce uh, basically cardiovascular disease. So how does this make sense? You're increasing cardio, your calcification, but you're reducing cardiovascular events. Well, the uh, authors came up with a hypothesis that the statins promote the calcifications to become more stable. So that is the proposed mechanism for how uh, uh, statins can actually help to reduce cardiovascular disease. 
uh, and then uh, for, they also found for the UCOC level that the coronary artery calcium score and the UCC have positive correlation in SAN users, but not in uh, non-SAN users. Uh, basically, it's it's very very small. You can say that it's not present there. And uh, the statin-induced vascular calcification might be mediated by the inhibition of vitamin K-dependent processes. Uh, but in addition to that, I also had uh, un uh, some questions about the study myself. So, first of all, if you look at uh, uh, they, the researchers originally, they named uh, this the controls in cardiovascular disease. Uh, and the controls had a moderate high risk of cardiovascular risk events on the cardiovascular disease patients had um, had already atrial fibrillation or uh hepat. but that means this is primary prevention or secondary prevention so if you actually look at the primary prevention secondary prevention and you look at the ucoc level wh why is there such a discrepancy look at it primary prevention ucoc very statistically significant Versus the secondary prevention, UCOC, not statistically significant. That was very interesting. And secondly, why was the CMGP not tested between the two groups? That was very strange as well. I don't know why the researchers didn't consider that. But um, my prime question was, why is uh, UCOC significant in the primary prevention group and not UCMGP, even though they both are markers for vitamin K2 status? That's interesting, right? Uh, and also, additionally, uh, why is it not significant for the secondary prevention group? So something uh, is different between those two. So there are also quite a few limitations about the study. So it had a small number of participants, so less than 100. Can't really be confident about the results with such a small number. Uh, the researchers did not uh, look at the type of stand or the dose or in duration of the stand. And they also didn't look at the vitamin K2 intake of the patient. So although the study did have quite a few limitations, it was nonetheless uh, quite an interesting one uh, for finding that vitamin K2 might actually be implicated with statins. And the statins might actually inhibit vitamin K dependent processes and actually lead to uh, calcification, which is very interesting. There's also additional work to be done here regarding the primary prevention and secondary prevention, finding out why UCOC was lower and not UCMGP in the primary prevention arm. There might actually be a role of vitamin K2 basically in the primary prevention of people being treated with stands, but this requires additional research. And this is this was quite interesting to me, so hopefully this was also interesting to you. Thank you for listening.